Judy, please, can you make an introduction? Okay, are we ready to start? Yeah. Um, so, it's my pleasure to introduce Campbell Patton to you. I've known Campbell for over 30 years. We train together and we work together for many years at the University of East Anglia. And Campbell did the amazing thing of introducing, focusing, focusing training to a very, very classical person-centered department. And the way that he did it was very characteristic of him. It was very gentle, it was very modest, almost that the university didn't notice what he was doing. <laughs> and I think that's the way to get things done in difficult institutions. And it revolutionized our person-centered training. And it was brilliant that actually UEA, our university, um, was the only university in the UK where you could receive focusing-oriented training. And that lasted for maybe 15 years? Something like that. Yeah, it was, you know, it was a really, we had a really good run. It doesn't, doesn't run anymore, sadly, but um, it's all down to Campbell. And last night, um, after we were eating, and Campbell left us, and I said to the other two people at the table, oh, I've got to say something about the tomorrow. What should I say? And I was recalling how um, a very good friend of mine, who's a very bright and a very critical person, had said that Campbell was the best teacher she'd ever had. You know, which is a huge compliment. This is Jen, Jen. Yeah, it was lovely. And the other person at the table, and I hope you don't mind me mentioning who it was. Do you mind? She's not saying anything, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> and she said that that was also her experience. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, and Campbell is so modest. I mean, he, he is the most modest colleague I have ever worked with. And it's like he's achieved miracles in his very, very quiet way. So, and I see him looking at his watch, so I'm not going yes. to go on. <laughs> I could go on, but no. Okay, thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. And I would just like to thank the organisers of this conference for being on such a splendid event. I mean, it really has been marvellous. Beautifully organised and very relaxed. I mean, it's really quite special. I mean, I, I'm very really tired now, so I don't go to many such things, but I'm so glad not to have missed this one. So, thank you. And and of course, coming to Greece, I mean, I love Greece. Um, for a philosopher, which I really am, I'm not really a, a therapist or focuser, I'm really a philosopher. <laughs> but um, I, I, you know, Greece, of course, is, is very special. Home of Western philosophy, and just down the road, Socrates was talking to people in the marketplace. Plato was developing his ideas, and, and then Aristotle was. In his, his philosophy. So, all, all, and all of those, of course, are still taught in university. It's not something in the, in the past. It's very much alive in philosophy teaching in the present. So, this is, this is like a, a spiritual home in many ways. And so, today, what I'm going to do is to talk about what I've called a new way of thinking about focusing. Um, it's what I've been mainly talking about is the idea of the felt sense. So this connects very much with what Bernardo was saying in the presentation. Um, and Bernardo, I come from rather difficult, rather different um, philosophical traditions, but I think in a way we really do agree the title of Bernardo's presentation, the felt sense, a beautiful yet misleading concept. And 
that, that would have done just as well for mine. <laughs> but we, we say different things, but there's, there's a sort of theme that is, is very much the same. Um, well, I don't want to say much about philosophy in itself, really, uh, and all the different traditions. I mean, I've been influenced mainly by Ludwig Wittgenstein right there. I mean, Wittgenstein and Jane are the two people who have influenced my thinking most. Um, might perhaps help just to give you three little quotations from Wittgenstein. He's, he's an unusual philosopher. And these are sort of in the background of what I'll be but the form of a philosophical problem is I can't find my way around. And I'll be starting with that sort of situation, really, because that's, I think very often I'm talking about the felt sense that um, Bernard had seven different accounts of it, and I'm going to give you an eight. Um, and uh, no doubt can be others. And you see, there's a sort of a puzzle about all this. Why is it so complicated? And I'll try, try and uh, explain what, what I think is going on there. Um, Wittgenstein is usually classed as an ordinary language philosopher, which means he, he tries to stay close to our ordinary ways of speaking and not introduce lots of technical terms. Um, and, but, but also, I mean, he's unusual even as an un ordinary language philosopher. He's not just interested in the way we ordinarily speak, but the ways in which our language actually gets in the way of our thinking. And that we, he thinks we suffer from a kind of intellectual illnesses. And a philosopher is a person who must cure many illnesses within themselves before they can reach the ideas of common sense. So Wittgenstein is a, a sort of like a coming back home having gone through all sorts of complex systems and theories and philosophical speculations, coming back to, to the everyday world, our ordinary world, because that's, that's the only world that really is. Um, and philosophy is the battle against the enrichment of our intelligence by language. And I hope I might convey a little bit about what that means in the course of this talk. Um, it's a bit like the misleading thing that Bernardo mentioned that um, <coughs> the language um, is how we, what we need to communicate, but at the same time, the way we picture the use of language can actually lead us into all sorts of problematic places. Um, and I think we have plenty of those in, in the talk. Um, so but that's, that's just a bit of background. <clears throat> um, actually, before we do the next bit, and I might just, might help just to have a very quick summary of what I'll be doing so you know what sort of uh, <coughs> presentation this is. So I start with the difficulties surrounding the idea of the felt sense that Donato was talking about and, and, and some other ones. Then a little bit on Wittgenstein. Um, and then the felt sense, which I think people would fairly much agree is, is some sort of feeling. Um, and then there's a question about is it a bodily feeling, or does it have to be a bodily feeling? And to get at that, I, I want to look at, a bit at emotions. Because emotions are a bit like a felt sense. Jenden talks quite a lot about the differences between felt senses and emotions. But they, they're not so far apart. And see, with emotions, the same question about the body comes up. See, are, are emotions things felt in the body? Are they always felt in the body? Um, and so that then would lead into an account of the, the felt sense. And, and then, finally, and this, you see, this may be a relief for some people, after all these sort of intellectual sort of investigation um, to what difference does it make in practice you know after discussing the felt sense in this sort of detail um, well so what uh, what difference does it make and 
what I, what I will do at the end is to go, go through a, a slightly modified version of Chamberlain's six steps, um, which is you know, the classical formulation of focusing. And I think with just a little bit of tweaking, it, it, it can get round the, the difficulties. It doesn't take much. Um, and so then we come back to something very simple, very straightforward. There's really no problem at all. That's it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so the, the slides now just contain some short pieces just summarizing some of the things I'll be I'll be saying. Um, but many focuses, I think, you know, whether newcomers or old hands may never have been troubled by the problems I'll be discussing. See, and that itself is an interesting fact. And I think that's partly due to the fact that these questions we're raising are, they're essentially philosophical questions. See, in philosophy from the time of Socrates onwards has been interested in questions such as what is time? How is knowledge possible? How can we know what other people feel? And the more a philosopher digs into such questions, the more difficult they turn out to be. But, see, for most people, most of the time, the questions just don't arise. The fact that there seem to be deep philosophical puzzles here about time and knowledge and other people's feelings usually doesn't interfere at all with our, our abilities to use these concepts in everyday life. But, on the other hand, the philosophical problems can every so often come to the surface and cause real trouble. A good example is, is that of behaviourist psychology, where the philosophical problem of our knowledge of other minds led some psychologists to try to develop a psychology that reduced mind to behaviour. And I think everybody today would accept that that was a total failure. It just didn't work. Um, but, but similarly, there are neuroscientists today who, without much understanding of the philosophical problems involved, try to explain our thoughts and feelings in terms of processes occurring in the brain. I mean, that sort of project is still going on, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> I'm quite sure that it will turn out to be completely abandoned before a very long. Um, in the same way, people can learn the basic focusing concepts, such as felt sense, and resonating and handle and so on, without being troubled by philosophical questions, such as what is a felt sense? Or how is it possible to learn about one's situation by attending to a vague, murky feeling in the centre of the body? I mean, that's just weird. That doesn't make any sense. Um, no, but you see, you don't have to raise that question. Uh, if you just ignore it and carry on doing folks and you're all right. Um, it's when you start to think about it that it, it goes wrong. So, but as I hope to show, the philosophical problems here, they, they do lurk in the background and can interfere with our attempts to explain what focusing is. Um, so probably the central concept of focusing is that of a felt sense. Kevin Kreiger recently um, Professor of Psychology, University of Seattle, <coughs> discusses the importance of focusing to psychotherapy in general, and says, by far the chief contribution FOT makes is bringing the felt sense to the field of psychotherapy. So, it's important. Um, however, focusing teachers don't always find it easy to explain to students what a felt sense is. <coughs> Some sort of explanation is called for because gender means something quite specific by the phrase. And in his more theoretical writings, he spends a lot of time explaining how felt senses are different from ordinary bodily sensations, or emotions, or images, or other psychological phenomena. He, he writes that there is no word in English that means what he means. That is why he had to invent the phrase. And then I'm 
Marisa Cornell, who probably has more experience of PG focusing than anyone else in the world, wrote a few years ago, after 33 years of focusing, I feel as though I am just beginning to really understand what a health sense is. 33 years. Now, see, isn't that, isn't that bizarre? I mean, she has a deep, deep knowledge of focusing. She knows about focusing in practice. She's taught it for 33 years. Um, she also has a PhD in linguistics. And she's a scholar, an academic. She has the experiential side, she has the intellectual side. But after 33 years, she's still not really sure what a health sense is. Which I think that's a clue that there's something odd here. There's this idea. Mm, written in science, I don't know my way around. It's odd. And actually, when I first learned focusing from Barbara McGavin in the early 90s, a close colleague of Anne, she was already saying, <coughs> along with Anne, she <coughs> thought that the use of the phrase felt sense could do more harm than good. I think Donata mentioned this possibility in her presentation. Because students naturally want to know what a felt sense is, but the explanations given usually don't enable them to decide whether what they feel is a felt sense or not. And then they spend most of their focusing session trying to decide what they've got. Is it a felt sense? Is it not a felt sense? <laughs> then, then the session sort of comes to an end, and of course an hour is up, and you know. <laughs> See, Anne wrote back in 1996, the biggest barrier to successfully finding a felt sense is wondering if you're doing it right, if you really have one. But the reason that students can spend so long wondering about whether they have a felt sense is that the teachers find it very difficult to explain what the phrase means. Now, occasionally, people have tried to say why it's so difficult to explain. For example, Peter Levine um, who wanted to make use of the term felt sense in his work on trauma, wrote, the felt sense is a difficult concept to define with words, as language is a linear process and the felt sense is a non-linear experience. However, I don't think that sheds much light on that. <laughs> now here are some more reasons why people could find the notion of a felt sense puzzling. <coughs> Jenden says that a felt sense is a special kind of bodily sensation and that it is usually located in the center of the body. However, other focusing teachers hold that the felt sense may form anywhere in the body. And Weiser writes that felt senses can be located outside the body. <laughs> now, that's, that's interesting. But you know what she, what she has in mind it is this. The focuser says that uh, I've got this scary something in my chest, and they point to their chest. And then they say, oh, it's, it's moving to my shoulder. And then their hand moves outside the body behind and say, oh, it's, now it's behind. And the health sense is there, behind my shoulder. Well, that's a strange thing. See, so again, we don't quite know where we are with this. How, how is the language working here? Um, and other folks in teachers hold the health senses may have no bodily location at all. And these disagreements are puzzling. See, is it that felt senses take quite different forms in different people? But why then do they all count as examples of the same thing? And then another thing that can cause difficulties is that the phrase felt sense has been picked up by therapists and others who use it in ways of their own. For some writers, the felt sense of a situation is simply the feel of a situation. So that if someone is asked how they feel about their situation, and they reply, well, it feels very embarrassing, then this embarrassed feeling would count as a felt sense. But for gender, feeling embarrassed is not a felt sense. Mm -hmm. It's an emotion. A felt sense is a murky, unclear feeling yeah. that leads to steps of change. It's not something that can be expressed by a familiar emotion word. So that, that's the first part. It's just to try and get across that there's a problem here, a problem of understanding what, what, what's going on. I mean, thinking about these things, I've been helped a lot by looking at the work of 
philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, Wittgenstein is an unusual philosopher in that, at least in his later work, he's not concerned to develop a system of philosophy in the way that many philosophers have, such as Kant or Schopenhauer, or indeed Gentle himself in his philosophical work and process model. Wittgenstein is skeptical about such systems and approaches philosophical problems in a less systematic way. He sees many philosophical problems as arising from misleading pictures that we have about the way our language works, and sees the aim of philosophy as simply to remove the intellectual confusions that we could get caught up in. <coughs> See, philosophy thus becomes, in a way, analogous to psychotherapy. Though unlike therapy, it's concerned with widespread intellectual confusions, rather than with personal, emotional confusions. And rather like good psychotherapy, this way of doing philosophy tends to be slow and sensitive to detail. It's not a matter of quick definitions and logical arguments, but of looking closely at how we actually use words, and also of noticing how our ways of picturing the use of words can mislead us. And I hope that what I mean by that will become clearer as we proceed. So I hope you've shown so far that there are some real difficulties with the notion of a felt sense. Difficulties that should be of interest not only to philosophers, but also to focusers. Because quite apart from it being satisfying to feel clear about what we're doing, there's something Anne Weiss has said recently, I can't find the reference at the moment, but what she wondered about it is whether the difficulties with the notion of a felt sense may help to explain why focusing is not caught on in the therapy world in the way that mindfulness has. And Kevin Kreiker makes the same kind of point recently when he wrote, the felt sense, the core of FOT practice, remains elusive and difficult to describe. This reality makes it very difficult for FOT to find and hold a place in contemporary theory and practice. Because although many may be genuinely interested, it is simply too difficult to grasp the approach without continued experiential practice with a teacher or therapist. Um, now I'm not, I don't really think he's right about that, but I mean you can see what, what, he, what he means. Um, okay. Um, well, one thing that seems clear is that a felt sense is a special kind of feeling. Now in English there are many different things that are loosely called feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for example, emotions such as anger or fear, moods such as anxiety or depression. I think we're not quite there yet. <laughs> Moods such as anxiety or depression, bodily sensations such as itches and muscle tensions, desires, impulses, likings and dislikings, these are all feelings. Feelings of familiar situations, such as the feeling you get when someone gives you a present that you don't want. <laughs> no, do you know that? <laughs> Hunches. Um, well, if you're not familiar with the English word hunch, hunch is like intuition, where you, you, you think something is so, but you, you can't explain why, why you think it. Um, hunches, such as, the, as a hunch that a decision is wrong, but you can't say why. And the dividing lines between these different kinds of feeling are not always sharp. For example, it can be difficult to say how some examples um, of fear differ from some examples of anxiety. But there's no doubt that in the everyday language of feelings, there are many useful distinctions. The feeling of tension in the jaw is somehow different in kind from a feeling of jealousy, even though they might be present at the same time. Okay. So feelings are only one category amongst what we could call psychological phenomena. I don't think that's a very good mm. phrase, but it's hard to know what else to call them. Um, but 
because in addition to feelings, there are, for example, beliefs, intentions, attitudes, and, and, and several others. See, the category of feelings could be compared with that of marine animals, you know, animals that live in the sea. There are plenty of other animals apart from marine animals, but also within the marine animals category, there are many different kinds of creatures. There are fish, which tend to look rather similar to each other, but also lobsters and crabs and octopuses, all of which are very different from fish. And then there are whales and dolphins, which, which look a bit like fish, which, which turn out to be very different when examined in more detail. Also, you may have seen natural history programs on television, which show us very strange creatures from the depths of the ocean, which are almost transparent, have no obvious heads, but long spindly legs, or possibly antennae. It's hard to know where they fit in with the more familiar creatures. They are a very special and unfamiliar sort of marine animal. So when we compare the classification of marine animals with the everyday classification of feelings, well then perhaps felt senses are analogous to these strange creatures. Jenner says that the felt sense is a feeling, that it could be classified as a sensation, but it's a special sort of sensation. It's also rather like an emotion, but nevertheless it isn't an emotion. It's some, something strange. I mean, that's just one sort of analogy. But now consider another analogy, which I think in the end is more helpful. If you're on a computer keyboard, there are 26 alphabetic keys, 10 numeric keys, several more keys for asterisks, hyphens, brackets, and so on. And each of these is used to produce a particular character on the screen, and later on a printout. And the characters are given code numbers in what's called the ASCII classification. So that uppercase A is number 65, B is 66, and so on. And we might explain all this to someone who's unfamiliar with keyboards by saying that each key corresponds to a printed character. See, they're, they're not familiar with the, these things. But after watching us type for a bit, they say, but what about the space key? It doesn't print anything. <laughs> And we say, no, well, that, that one just needs a space. <laughs> but you can still think of it as a character. Admittedly, it's a rather odd sort of character, but it's listed as character 32 in the ASCII system. And they say, well, okay, what about this one? Mark return. <laughs> what character is that? We explain that pressing this key brings the cursor back to the beginning of the next line. It doesn't print a character at all. They say, well, but couldn't you think of this as a very special sort of character? So what do we say to that? Well, perhaps, well, I suppose you, you could think of it that way. It is character 13 in the ASCII list. And they say, well, this is fascinating. What a, what a very strange sort of character. But of course, there's nothing at all strange here. It only seems that there's something strange because we've been picturing the keys as all working in the same way so as to produce something on the screen. And in a way, that is true. The space key could be said to produce something on the screen, <coughs> but that something is a nothing. <laughs> so here you get into some odd ways of talking. How strange. But again, there is nothing strange here. The feeling of strangers is a kind of illusion which is generated by the way we have been picturing the use of the keys. <laughs> See, in the comparison of feelings with kinds of marine animals, we ended with a strange deep sea creature. Now, it really exists and really is strange compared with the other creatures. In the comparison with the keyboard symbols, we end instead with a strange way of speaking. And Wittgenstein suggests that in thinking about what are called mental phenomena, we often get into strange ways of talking and then think that we are dealing with strange kinds of things, inner things. But for him, these strange kinds of things are, in a sense, illusions. It's not that we don't have feelings. Of course we do. But picturing feelings as inner things or processes is a bit like picturing space or return as strange kinds of character. So I hope this will all become clearer as we go on. And for the moment, I just want to convey something of the flavour of Wittgenstein's approach to our ways of talking about feelings.
as I said earlier, it generally regards a felt sense as a feeling that is in some ways like a bodily sensation, such as a, a feeling of muscle tension, in some ways like an emotion, such as fear. And I'll say a bit more about bodily sensations later, but, but first I think it's helpful to discuss the nature of emotions. <coughs> Okay, um, well, I think motions, they're always linked with particular kinds of situation. For any named emotion, we can, with a bit of thought, say roughly what the relevant kinds of situation is. For example, we speak of fear in situations where there is a response to some perceived danger. We speak of jealousy in situations where a person A is upset because person B has preferred person C to them. <laughs> Pretty much what jealousy is. <laughs> we speak of hoping for an event to occur where the person will be disappointed if the event did not occur. And embarrassment involves one having done something socially inappropriate. Feeling guilty involves one having done something one considers to be wrong. And uh, these are just rough sketches. Our emotional language is subtle and complex, and things may depend on the tone of voice and so on. So more may, be need, may need to be said to specify what the relevant kind of situation is. But the important point is that we can, at least roughly, set out what the situation is that corresponds to each named emotion. Um, but emotions are, are not limited to those which have names, so this is the point that gender emphasis emphasizes. And within each named emotion, there will be varieties of emotional feeling that can be specified in various ways. For example, we feel jealous, but it's a particular sort of jealousy. Thus, someone might say, not simply that they are jealous, but they are jealous in a resigned sort of way, rather than in an aggressive sort of way. In some languages, there could be different words for these two kinds of jealousy. Or someone might say, yes, I am jealous, but I was thinking of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. I'm jealous in the sort of way that Dolly is jealous of the governess, not in the way that Karenin is jealous of Vronsky. Um, I remember picking that sort of example out years ago. I can no longer remember story well enough to know what the difference is, but, <laughs> but it, 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 it's there, the, 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 the feelings are different. Um, yeah. Of course, you, you, in order to understand that, you have to remember to know the, the, the novel, because otherwise it, it makes no sense. It, it, it's that emotions can be hard, subtle, more subtle emotions can be hard to share. Um, now these varieties of an emotion are often specified by a novelist by telling a story of the sort of situation which gives rise to the emotion. And often in focusing situations, in focusing sessions, little stories are told, some of which are expressed in imagery. To take an example from Anne Meissen, um, a focuser speaks of, of this. Having an image of seeing a row of blackbirds on a wire they are huddled together, and a cold wind is blowing. Then she says that some of them are flying away, but some are just staying there. It's like they are resigned to the cold, the ones that are staying. Those are the ones that no other bird is near. They're on their own. There's especially one of them. It's huddled and cold and sad. Now, you see, this story imagery specifies the emotional response much more exactly than it can be, than it can be specified by a single word. Okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are still speaking of a kind of situation here. The person listening might say, well, it sounds a bit like what John felt in that story you mentioned last week. And the focuser might say, well, yes, like that, exactly. Um, I remember when she was around three or four years old, 
My daughter liked being read stories about Little Grey Rabbit and a rather boisterous character called Hare. She had listened to one of these stories the previous night, and when her mother next morning did something that upset her, she exclaimed, Oh, Mummy, just like Hare! <laughs> Little grey rabbit situation and my daughter's situation were no doubt different in many ways. But my daughter recognised the same kind of situation and the same kind of emotional feeling. I mean, thus, while there are many emotions for which we have names, I mean, far more than those in the lists that psychologists are fond of, beyond these, there's an indefinite number of emotions that correspond to kinds of situations that are familiar within a particular culture can only be expressed by telling little stories. I will call these unnamed emotions, emotional feelings. And I think one source of confusion in talking about felt senses is that we may be inclined to think of the felt sense as an emotional feel of a situation. See, the blackbird story was the expression in imagery of the emotional feel of a situation. But such an emotional feel is not a felt sense. In fact, the blackbird story continues like this. It's huddled and cold and sad. No, not exactly sad. He's more, it's hard to put into words. You see, here is the felt sense. And it's here, as Anne says, that the person, strictly speaking, begins to focus. In focusing sessions, the expression of emotional feeling and the expression of a felt sense, she often interleave with one another. See, an example taken from Gentlin is this. So the client says, well, what came to me was like the image I have. But when I got it, I had an image of a fence. And part of it is really treacherous. It's like, and there's a pause barbed wire. You don't touch that. You can't go through or get past it. But another part of it has a little hole, and that part I could slip through. A part of it is just poles and a little barbed wire, and I could really crawl over it if I wanted to. What felt the best right now was to crawl through that little hole. That felt, and there's a pause, like pause, felt like saying, here I am, I'm coming through. A really neat part coming through and looking back to see the reaction. At the same time feeling, I don't care what the reaction is. And here there's the expression of emotional feeling through words as well as imagery. But every so often the client pauses and waits for a further image or further words. It's like, pause, barbed wire felt like pause, saying, here I am, coming. See, and as Jendon uses the term, the felt senses here occur in the pauses. They are not the emotional feelings that are expressed in the words and images. But it, it, it's easy to get confused here. In, in his first paper on focusing, Jendon didn't use the term felt sense, but instead spoke of trying to get the feel of this problem as a whole. See, suppose we ask someone to do this, and they say, yes, I, I can feel it as a whole. It, it's a feeling of being put in a position where whatever I do, I will hurt someone. Now that's a clearly articulated emotional feeling. But just because it is clearly articulated, it's not a felt sense. A felt sense, Jendon says, is something vague or murky. Since so you contrast that with, yes, I can feel it as a whole, but... I don't know how to put it into words. See, that tells you that they have a felt sense. Now, I'll return to the question of when exactly we speak of felt senses. But first I want to look at another issue that has been prominent in the discussion of felt senses. This is the question of whether a felt sense is a bodily sensation, whether it is felt in the body. And in order to approach that question, it will be helpful to consider whether emotions and emotional feelings are felt in the body. Well, to have an emotion, 
involves responding to a situation of a particular kind. But there are many different kinds of response. If we see someone running from a bull, we say that they are afraid. I mean, to run in that context is to be afraid. But another person, on seeing the bull charging towards them, might freeze, and that too would count as fear. Someone else, seeing the bull from a distance, might experience tension in their chest or stomach. And feeling those bodily sensations could be said to be their fear. Or after being chased by the bull, the person, now sitting at home, might have recurrent thoughts and feelings about the incident. And these responses could be said to constitute the fear that they still feel following the episode. We'll consider the emotion of hope as another example. Um, as I suggested before, to say that someone hopes that an event will occur, it, it, it um, means that they would be disappointed if it didn't occur. So if, you, if you know that someone will be disappointed that this doesn't happen, then you, then you know that they're hoping for it. A person's hope for something could be manifest in their imagining the occurrence of the event, or in their pacing excitedly up and down, or in a holding of the breath. But these responses only count as manifestations of hope if the situation is one in which the person will be disappointed if the event doesn't occur. The responses in themselves do not constitute hope or feelings of hope. The same responses could be manifestations of an expectation that the event will occur. But hoping is different from expecting. We often expect things that we certainly don't hope for. And we can hope for things that we don't really expect to occur. And these two feelings are very different, but they're not distinguished by any differences in the bodily sensations involved, but by the fact that in hoping we'd be disappointed that the event doesn't occur, while in expecting we would be surprised if it doesn't occur. Um, you may need to think more about that. <laughs> So, emotions may involve bodily sensations, as well as many other kinds of response. But none of these things are essential to the emotion being the sort of emotion it is. For there to be an emotion, one has to respond in some way to a particular kind of situation. But how one responds can involve behaviour, thoughts, impulses, imagery, and also bodily sensations. In some cases, the response to the situation may involve quite intense desires or aversions, and the accompanying impulses and bodily sensations can overwhelm us. It's a familiar idea that, ocean, that emotions are to be contrasted with rational beliefs. But that's not generally true. We may quite reasonably feel hopeful about that an event will occur, and our feeling of guilt could be entirely appropriate to the situation. And in some cases, I think the response may be almost entirely linguistic. For example, we learn to use the word wistful in certain circumstances, though I couldn't say right now what those kinds of circumstances are, and probably you can't. Although it was interesting, I think it was yesterday, I was, Julie happened to use the word wistful. Um, and we began to talk a bit about, you know, what, what, what is it to be wistful? And I think we concluded something like, well, it's like remembering something of joy in the past and regretting that it is no more. I mean, that's probably not quite like it, but, you know, we, we, got, we got a sort of a, a, a sense of what it is to be wistful. And I think with all these words, quite often, you, you, at, the, at first, you, you can't say what it, what it means. But it doesn't take much to just take a few different situations. Would you call that wistful? Not really, no. But what about this? Well, yeah, that, 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 that's wistful. But no, that, that isn't. It's a, it's a very careful looking at, at how you would use the word, where you would use it, when you would use it. Um, but, but certainly, the, at the time you use it, um, you, you may not have any understanding of, of what what the context is that makes it that kind of feeling. Um, and certainly the feeling wistful may not, may not involve any specific behaviour or bodily sensations or thoughts or images. My saying I feel wistful 
maybe my only response at the time to the kind of circumstances I find myself in. But she said, then someone will say, but, but don't I have a, a wistful feeling, a, a datum, a direct reference, as Jandin sometimes call it? Well, I, I can say that, but it doesn't seem to add anything to my saying that I am wistful. There's no feeling here that's independent of what I say. No feeling on which I could base what I say. Because I don't base what I say, in fact, I don't base what I say on anything. I mean, certainly not on my knowledge of the circumstances in which the use of the word is learned. But I not, may not be able to say what these circumstances are. I've learned to use the word, but I haven't learned to say how it is used. I've simply picked up the use of the word uh, as an articulation of my response. That's what we say in English in these circumstances. Now, that seems puzzling. Well, I think it is puzzling. Um, Compare how it is with a hunch or intuition about something. Punches can form a helpful bridge to the notion of a felt sense. She suppose that on returning home from a walk, we have to decide whether to turn right or turn left. And I say, to the left. My companion says, how do you know? And I reply, well, it's just a hunch, but I bet I'm right. And we go to the left. And indeed, this turns out to be the way home. To have a hunch is to think that something is so, without being able to justify what one thinks. It, it, it's not just a guess. We sometimes are very sure that our hunch is right. Now, suppose someone says, when you said to the left, surely something must have gone on in your mind that made you say that. Perhaps you had an image of turning left. Or maybe the word left just came into your mind. It must have been something that made you say, to the left. And I think for that about for a minute, and I say, no, I don't, there really wasn't anything like that. We came to the junction, and I spontaneously said, to the left. That was all that happened. I had a hunch. But that's just to say, I couldn't justify what I've said. But now the sceptical person says, but you, you must have had a feeling that you should turn left. The hunch was that feeling. See, what should I say to that? Well, perhaps, how do you know what went on in me? I'm telling you that nothing went on. <laughs> but you have a picture or theory that says that something must have gone on. Well, so much the worse for the theory. <laughs> See, this talk of the hunch as a feeling adds nothing at all to the description of what happened. It seems to be the invention of a person who believes that we must always have feelings in the sense of inner data going on in our minds before we can speak. If that clearly is not true, usually we speak without anything special going on in our mind. <laughs> um, so, in sum, we, we could say that to have an emotion is to respond to a particular kind of situation. The response may be a matter of having learned of having certain bodily sensations or other things such as characteristic behaviour, impulses, thoughts or images. It's misleading to say that the emotion is the response, that the running away or the inclination to run away or the dry throat or the facial expression is the fear. But nor is it right to say that the response is simply a sign or accompaniment of the emotion. Do I think we want there to be a thing or a process that is the emotion. But not all words function as the names of things or processes. Emotion words draw our attention to particular kinds of lived situation. But there need not be anything in the situation that is the emotion. As I said, if someone hopes that an event will occur, that is a particular kind of situation. The kind of situation where they'll be disappointed if the event doesn't occur. But it doesn't follow that there's a thing or process in the situation that is the hope. We are inclined to picture the hope or as something going on in the person at the time. But the fact is that nothing need have gone on in them at the time. They might have thoughts or images of the anticipated event, but there's no necessity for such things to have gone on. All that is necessary is that they would respond to the non-occurrence of the event with disappointment. If we know that, then we know that they hope for the event. 
Now, the, the picture of feelings as inner events or processes is a, a, a captivating one. I mean, it, it appeals to us. It's almost like we can't get away from it. Wittgenstein suggests that it arises partly from another captivating picture, that of the meanings of words being the things they refer to. In an infant school classroom, there may be pictures on the wall of dogs, trees, tables, and so on, each being intended to illustrate the meaning of the word that is written alongside the picture. <coughs> we think of the meaning of the words as being displayed in the pictures, and say that the meaning of the word is the kind of thing it picks out. But there are many, many words for which that is not true. There are no things in the word, in the world, that are picked out by the words not or therefore, for example. Wittgenstein argues that to specify what a word means does not usually involve presenting examples of the things or processes it refers to, but specifying how that word is used, that not, for example, is used to make a denial, therefore tells us that what has just been said is a reason for believing what is about to be said. But there are no nots or therefores in the world. So if we can free ourselves from the picture that for each word there's a kind of thing or process, we may be able to see that it doesn't have to be a feeling that a person has when they hope for something or fear something or experience some other emotion. But as Wittgenstein says, it's hard to free ourselves from such pictures because they are embedded in our language. I just refer to experiencing some other emotion. <coughs> See, this form of word suggests that there is, in addition to the emotion, the experiencing of the emotion. And then this can bring us back to picturing hope as an inner process that we are now calling an experience. It's not that there's anything wrong with saying that a person feels hope or experiences a feeling of hope. Just as there's nothing wrong with saying that a person feels that they should take the right-hand path. But if we try to take these feelings out of their contents and ask what they are in themselves, we are likely to end up talking nonsense. We might, for example, ask whether the feeling of hope is a bodily sensation and wonder whether that tingling sensation we feel is the hope. Or we might ask where in our body do we have the hunch that we should take the right-hand path? Can we detect the hunch in the way our legs are inclined to move? But such questions, I think, lead us only into confusion. They're not sensible questions to ask, because they presuppose that words for feelings are names of things or processes going on inside the person. Okay. So now we come back to felt senses. So in this last section, we'll be concerned with one important group of feelings, those that are called emotions. As I said earlier, there are many other kinds of feeling, but the one we're especially interested in <coughs> is the kind of feeling that gender calls a felt sense. Um, and as you will know, Gendlin had discovered in his work with counselling clients that clients who make best progress are those who engage in therapy in a special way. Rather than simply talking about their difficulties or speculating about what is wrong with them or directly expressing their emotions, they say what they are thinking or feeling, and then pause. And the therapist can see that this is a special sort of pause. It's not that the client has run out of things to say, or that they are afraid to go on. Rather, they are searching for words for something they can't yet express. They may screw up their face, or rotate their hand in the air, or say things like, it's not that I'm afraid of him, but pause. I'm not easy with him. Pause. He makes me feel sort of tangled up inside. Pause. I can't put it into words. They're clearly responding to some difficulty in their relationship with this person. But they can't articulate that response. Or rather, they can't articulate it yet. Their situation is one of being on the way to articulating their response. It is in this kind of situation that we say that the person has a felt sense of something. They have, as it were, reached the edge of what they can say. Gender discusses an example 
where a person is talking about their fear of approaching someone at a party. They say, I think I know what goes into that fear. It's that I've always been scared just to make a decision on my own. I'm scared it will be wrong, but, um, and they pause. And this person, Jandin Wright, has a sense of the edge. Um is the felt sense. I think that's probably Jenna's best definition of the felt sense. <laughs> See, what the um tells us is that the person hasn't yet found a way of articulating their response, but they, that they hope to do so soon. Instead of saying um, they might rotate their hand in the air. Or if they are familiar with focusing, they might say that they have a peculiar sort of feeling, a felt sense. But it's misleading to say that there is a thing there that they feel when they have a felt sense. Just as it's misleading to say that there is a thing which one feels when one hopes for something. Or that there's a feeling called a hunch when one has a hunch. Yet as in the case of hopes and hunches, we may experience various bodily sensations when we have a felt sense. We might feel tension in our chest or a gnawing feeling in the stomach or bodily sensations associated with rotating our hand in the air, drumming our fingers on the desk. Are these the felt sense? Well, it's the same as it is with emotions. We do speak of feeling anger in our chest and fear in our gut. And we may be able to identify the bodily sensations involved, such as muscular tensions or contractions. But as we've seen, it's misleading to say that the emotion is that bodily sensation. Rather, we are responding to a situation in which we are being insulted or threatened. And for that reason, we are said to be scared, or angry or scared. Just by attending to the bodily sensation, we couldn't tell which emotion we are feeling. It's only in the relevant context that we can say that the tightness is the anger, or the contracted feeling is the fear. In the case of a felt sense, in the relevant context, is that the person is responding to a situation but can't yet articulate their response. That is the point at which they pause and say, um. When Jandon says the um is the felt sense, we know what he means, but clearly he is not saying that the felt sense is the utterance of a word. In the same way, the felt sense is not the rotation of the hand in the air, nor the gnawing sensation the person might have in their stomach. The difficulty is, and we picture a felt sense as some sort of inner thing or process, but fail to realize that in saying that someone has a felt sense, we are not reporting on anything going on in them. What we are reporting is they can't yet find a way of articulating their response. And it might help to reflect on what happens when the person does succeed in articulating their response. They may let out a deep breath, smile, and say, now I've got it. Or they may simply say, OK, I'm jealous, or scared, or whatever. Now, just before they said or did these things, see, did they have to have a feeling that they had found what they were looking for? They may well say, no, it just came to me. But doesn't say, now I've got it, or the deep release of breath express a feeling. Well, as with hunches, someone might say, that there must be such a feeling. But I think we should always be suspicious about people who tell us what we must be feeling. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that to say that someone has a felt sense is to say that they respond to a situation that can't yet articulate their response, but hope and expect to do so soon. More briefly, we can say with Jenton that the felt sense is the um. However, there are many places where gender says something much more than that. In discussing where the change steps come in therapy, or where they come from, he says, the steps of change and process do not come directly from the recognizable feelings as such. They come rather from an unclear, fuzzy, murky, something there, an odd sort of direct datum of awareness. And then again, what do we assume the client will do with the listening response? we hope and assume that clients will check the response, not with what they said or thought, but with some more inner being, place, data, <coughs> sense. We have no ordinary word for that. Now, is this notion of an inner data that Wittgenstein questions? 
See, undoubtedly we talk of inner thoughts and feelings, and we may picture them as inner things or processes going on in our heads and bodies. But this surely is picture language. We do not mean that if a surgeon opened up our head or body, they would find the thoughts or feelings there. It's a way of talking, a picturesque mode of description, and one which does not mislead us in everyday conversations. The problems only begin when we suppose that the inner processes constitute explanations for what we say and do. See, then we will start to say things like, he said, this, he said he was afraid because there was a scary feeling or process or datum inside him, and he recognized it as fear. But that is not why an English speaker says, I'm afraid. The real explanation is that they've learned to use this phrase in situations where some danger threatens. The same misleading picture of the inner datum is what causes the difficulties with the phrase felt sense. A person may pause in a focusing session and speak of having a vague feeling that they cannot put into words. To have such a feeling is to have a felt sense. There's no problem with that. The problem comes if we now try to explain why they pause by saying that they have a special sort of feeling or inner datum to which they now need to give their attention and from which may soon come other feelings that are helpful for them. See, the inner datum or felt sense is supposed to contain all the intricate detail of the problem and within it the person may find something that is of help to them. See, that's the picture. However, the real explanation of why the person pauses is simply that they can't yet find the words to articulate their response, although they are seeking them, and with luck will soon find them. They find them through attending to the situation or problem as a whole, and realizing that just these words give expression to some aspect of the problem. See, the difference between the two formulations lies in the fact that the first formulation, in the first formulation, the person attends to an inner data, describes it, whereas in the second, they attend to their situation and articulate their response to it. See, I think the reason Jendin prefers the first formulation is that he is concerned with an important difference in the way clients speak in therapy. It's the difference between simply speaking and speaking after pausing to check whether this is really what one wants to say or is all that one wants to say. Jendon thinks that in the process the person consults an inner datum, whereas I think Wittgenstein would say that this inner datum is a fabrication or an illusion. For Jendon, the inner datum is an it, a direct reference, something one can attend to, in there, there, where we have our feelings. The job of the therapist is then to respond to the client in a way that helps the client to find the inner datum. But the alternative formulation is that the client is responding to their situation in a way that they can't yet articulate. The job of the therapist is to encourage the client to attend further to their situation and to articulate further whatever new responses come to them. And I'd like to end by looking in a, bit, in a bit more detail about how this alternative formulation would, would work in practice and what, what difference it makes. See, much of the traditional focusing framework can remain in place, beginning with clearing the space. This is not something one always needs to do but it can be an important way of bringing attention to a specific problem. Because the point is to attend exclusively to that problem for the moment. But how do we do that? See, attention is one of these puzzling psychological words. What, what, is, it, what is attention? What is it to attend to something? Um, is that an inner state? Um, well, how, how do we attend to something, actually? Well, by not letting ourselves be distracted by other, the other problems. We attend to one thing by not allowing ourselves to attend to other things, as we mind our own business by not minding other people's business. <laughs> it can help if we give some brief attention to the other problems, but not just ignoring them, and then attend to the problem we wish to work with. Okay. So then the next step is to attend to this problem as a whole, which is something general has always emphasized that, that we attend to the problem as a whole. Before the session, we may have spent some time thinking about the problem and noticing various things that are involved in it. 
We may need to remind ourselves of what the problem is and what seems to be upsetting or concerning about it. In other words, we bring that whole problem to mind. We are going to focus on the problem and we want to go beyond what we already know about it, beyond the familiar feelings that it arouses in us. To get to something new, we need to attend to the whole of the problem. Because what might help us is not to be found in what we already know. But we don't know where it is to be found in the situation. It could be anywhere. Or we might need to construct something new. So we need to keep the whole problem in mind. Well, now how do we attend to it as a whole? Well, by not attending to its particular aspects. If we find ourselves attending to some particular aspect of the problem, we need to stop doing that and let our attention come back to the problem as a whole. And this, I think, is probably the most difficult part of focusing. We are so used to attending to details that we find it hard to attend to something as a whole. Yet we can do this. The problem is there as a whole. We chose it for amongst other problems. All we have to do is to open ourselves to all of that, putting aside any specific aspects that come to mind. And then familiar focusing questions may help. As we keep our attention on the problem as a whole, we can gently ask ourselves, what is this really all about? Or, or what is the crux of this? What, what is needed here? And then we wait and see if anything comes. And often something does come. And often it is a surprise to us. It could be a word, a bodily sensation, a impulse, a wish, a liking for something, an image, a fragment of music, a memory. It's something that has come out of our awareness of the problem as a whole. And is likely, therefore, to have some relevance to the problem. It's something new in connection with the problem. So now we gently ask, what is it about the problem that brings this what is it about the problem that makes me think of this, or feel that, or want to do this, or remember that? And again we wait. And then other feelings, or words, and so on may come. And whatever comes, we may try asking, is that exactly it? And then sense the reply, yes, it is, or no, not exactly, more like this, or no, not just that, also this. And finally, if we are fortunate, we may find ourselves saying something like, oh, so that's what it's about. Or, so there's a whole new side to this. Or, I never thought of it like that. You see, and all of that can be explained without using the term felt sense. But it's clear enough where that phrase could be brought in. It is at the point where we attend to the problem as a whole. At this point, someone might say to themselves, I'm feeling the problem as a whole. And they might picture this feeling of the problem as a vague, fuzzy thing that they sense in their stomach, but which nevertheless contains within all the familiar aspects of the problem, together with innumerable other aspects that could be helpful. Now this picture need not cause trouble, so long as the focuser remains aware that they need to be attending to the feel of the problem and its unarticulated ages. What would cause trouble? would be if they started to ask whether this fuzzy image they have really is a felt sense, or whether they should be attending to the tight feeling they have in their stomach. See, then I think they would get lost. As I mentioned earlier, in his very first paper on focusing, Jenton himself did not use the term felt sense. Instead, he laid out following, in the following way guidelines for therapists who would be teaching focusing to patients. He writes, this is in 1969, we must explain that it's possible to sense a problem as a whole. People rarely let the crux of the problem come freshly to them from their feel of the problem as a whole. They already know what the crux is, or they, they decide what it is. Therefore, before we begin, we instruct the patient on this point. When you have a feel of the whole problem, don't decide what's important about it. Feel it all, and don't decide anything. Wait and let the main crux come to you freshly. Mm -hmm. And I think that that way of putting it is much likely to, less likely to cause difficulties than the way in which he formulated the focusing instructions later on. The crucial point is that one is to attend to the feel of the problem 
and then wait to see what more there is to it, or where the edges of the problem are. But uh, attending to the field of the problem should be understood to mean no more than attending to the problem. It's one of those cases where referring to a feeling adds nothing to what can be said without referring to the feeling. Uh, for, for example, from things I've mentioned before, to, to, to be hopeful, to feel hopeful, to have a feeling of hope, you know, are just different ways of saying the same thing. Namely, that one will be disappointed if the hopeful thing doesn't occur. There's nothing wrong with picturing hope as an inner feeling, but this is a picture, it's a, it's a way of speaking. And that's a final analogy. Consider the fact that instead of saying that a person has a felt sense of something, we might in English say that they have something on the tip of their tongue. Now that says the same thing, namely that they can't yet articulate their response. But it's clearly just a way of speaking. Someone who started to wonder about what exactly was there on the tip of their tongue when they were trying to articulate their response would surely be deeply confused. In the same way, I think, a person is confused if they start to wonder about what exactly is there in the centre of the body when they are trying to articulate their response. So, just to end, um, I, I'm sort of aware that the discussion has been quite elaborate, but, you see, that's not because focusing is something elaborate. It's the confusions and misunderstandings surrounding focusing that give rise to the elaborations. In Wittgenstein's metaphor, the untangling of a knot has to be as complex as the knot itself. But the result of untangling it is something simple. It seems to me there doesn't have to be any fundamental difficulty in teaching focusing. I'm a bit sceptical about the extract I quoted from Kreiker, that it is simply too difficult to grasp the approach without continued experiential practice for the teacher or therapist. After all, Jenin wrote his original focusing book as a self-help manual, and it sold half a million copies. I think that in practice, people are able to read past the picture language that Jenin often uses in speaking of the felt sense as a murky inner datum, and appreciate that what he really means is that we need to give attention to those places where we are responding to our situation in a way that we can't get fully articulate. That may not always be easy to do, but it's not something complicated or mysterious. Thank you.